Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve DeMello, Director of Healthcare here at Citrus. I'd like to welcome you to today's research exchange. I'd also like to welcome our web viewers from the other Citrus campuses. Um, a few reminders, our Eye for Energy series, um, much like Research Update, is held every Friday, speaker this Friday as well. Um, if you're interested in and planning to participate in the Big Ideas competition, applications are due on March 7th. And a reminder that everything you have can go into the compost with the exception of the sandwich wraps and plastic bags for the cookies. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hervé Delinguet, Research Director at INRIA, the French National Institute for Research and in Information and Communication Sciences. Dr. Delinguet works with the Asclepos Project, which focuses on analyzing biomedical images with advanced geometrical, statistical, physical and functional models and simulating physiological systems with computational models built from biomedical images and other signals. Hervé has led the CardioSense 3D Large Initiative Action for Electromechanical Modeling of the Heart since 1995 and received his PhD from Ecole Centrale de Paris. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hervé Delinguet. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction. So good morning, um, everybody. And uh, as we say in France, uh, bon appétit. Uh, so I'd like just to, to complement uh, the introduction from Professor Demelo. So just uh, saying a few words about INRIA. Uh, so INRIA is the national, the French National Center for uh, Computer Science and Control. And it includes um, around 3,000 researchers, including uh, more than a thousand full-time researchers and teaching researchers. So the, 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 the centers are spread around France. There are eight different centers. And I have a pleasure to work at the centers located in the southeast of France, uh, in Sofia Antipolis, close to uh, Nice and Cannes. And uh, so my uh, research focus is uh, around uh, the analysis of medical images. And as you know, medical imaging now is a, is a growing part of uh, clinical practice. And uh, I'm just uh, here showing some uh, of, um, I would say, uh, most common uh, medical images that you can encounter, starting from CT scan, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, PET um, functional images, and ultrasound. And so the characteristic of those images is that most of them are volumetric, which means that you can actually have an insight uh, uh, of three-dimensional uh, characteristics of a human body. But actually, for some of image modalities, they are not only three-dimensional, but they are also spatial temporal. So they also include uh, a time series. So you can actually, uh, with here showing a cine MRI of a heart, you can actually look at, at the cardiac contraction uh, during the cardiac cycle uh, using uh, MRI or CT scans. Now, as I already mentioned, so medical imaging is playing a, a growing role uh, in clinical practice. And uh, it's actually being used at the different stages um, of this practice. So for instance, including a diagnosis, uh, therapy planning, uh, for instance, uh, using in, in neurosurgery, or so forth, to guide the therapy and to perform patient follow-up. Now there is a, a, a clear uh, growth of a, Imaging now importance. I would say the importance of those imaging is growing, um, without doubt, and uh, this is due to, uh, for instance, the improvement of um, uh, image modalities, uh, which translates into a better image resolution, better contrast, but also the fact that you have new uh, modalities that are coming um, uh, almost uh, every year. So, for instance, uh, uh, Molecular imaging is a very uh, rapid developing uh, technology. Also, because of the health um, infrastructure is more and more equipped with those uh, imaging uh, devices, there are more and more images being acquired for, for, for each patient. And due to the global aging of a, in, in developed countries, there are more and more patients and, and less doctors proportionally to the number of patients. And uh, this puts a lot of pressure to manage this information, uh, the acquisition and the analysis of those images. And this led uh, to the development of a uh, digital patient record infrastructure, which is, I think, being developed in most uh, developed countries. 
Now, actually, this uh, growth of uh, medical imaging is taking care, is, is uh, taking place, while there's also a growing need for personalized healthcare uh, in, in order to improve diagnosis and therapy. So, performing uh, therapy planning for sp specific patients. And this should be done also with a constraint of, uh, uh, to be uh, cost effective due to the financial constraint that we, uh, we all know. And uh, so given all those facts, I think there is also uh, a need to have a computerized tools that are also um, can be applied uh, on those medical images in order to satisfy the different constraints that I've already mentioned. Now, what are those computerized tools? So uh, those tools uh, related to medical image analysis, they are, have been developed actually to extract uh, um, some quantities um, in the images, useful for diagnosis, for instance, measuring the, uh, the tumor volume. They have also been developed in order to fuse the different uh, image modalities. So I mentioned different modalities, and actually it's very important that you can um, make a correspondence and, and fuse, merge these two information. Uh, those tools are also being used to plan uh, uh, therapeutic uh, strategies and to guide the therapy. And so uh, what I call uh, the medical image analysis tools, they are computer software. And as such, uh, as algorithms, they are based on, uh, on a priori knowledge and hypothesis. And uh, this, those, uh, this knowledge and uh, hypothesis is what I call a computational model. And now the, the, I will spend a few uh, slides in this introduction to actually go through the types of computational models that have been developed to, in order to analyze those images. And I will start with um, the most, I would say, um, um, common ones is the, uh, or I would say, basic ones, which is the uh, modeling the anatomy or the geometry of a, of a human body. So th this uh, translates into algorithms for uh, delineating structures from images. This is called image segmentation. Also, registering images together. So this has been uh, the topic of medical image analysis for the past 20 years. And uh, as it's successful in many respects, but the, it's very difficult to produce uh, autom automated tools in, the, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this respect, uh, despite the uh, number uh, of years of research. So in this slide, I'm just showing uh, the reconstruction of a brain, skull, and, and brain ventricles from MRI, just to illustrate uh, this topic of 3D reconstruction from medical images. But the models actually also includes a pro knowledge about the appearance of, the of structures in those images. So for instance, here on this image, you see um, uh, five MR images of, uh, of the same patients with a glioma. So it's a, a tumor of the glial cells. And you can see that this uh, glioma have a different aspect uh, uh, depending on the, uh, on, on the image sequence, uh, on the MR image sequence. So for a T-white weighted image, you, you, you have a more uh, clear view of a ne necrotic core of a glioblastoma, while in the T2 weighted, you, you see more of a edema surrounding the, um, uh, the, uh, the tumor. So uh, this needs to be uh, actually encountered and modeled in those uh, models. There is also a third type of models, um, which is uh, not only uh, describing the geometry and the appearance, but also describing the, the physical behavior of the tissue, uh, and especially soft tissue. So what I'm showing here as an example is a simulation of, a, of liver surgery. This is some old work we've performed in a, in a the Asclepius team. Well, we simulate the resection of, a, of liver. So while we actually uh, include, we, we do the reconstruction of a liver anatomy from medical images, but we also include some physical property, biomechanical property of a liver in order to perform this uh, simulation. And here, of course, for, this is meant to be for uh, the training of surgeons, so there is some real-time constraints that needs to be um, accounted. But there is also a, a further model, a level of modeling, which is the physiological model. So where you not only describe the physical property of a, of a tissue, but also the um, uh, the relationship between the different organs. Uh, so the, here, what we are modeling is the more uh, physiopathology, which is the, the growth of a tumor in the glial cells. And the fact that actually 
those glial cells, they grow uh, more rapidly in the white matter fiber uh, that in the, in the gray matter. So you have this anisotropic growth that is being modeled uh, here as an example of this concept. So you can see that you have this different level of modeling that can be applied for analyzing images. And so if you apply those models to uh, images, you can, um, um, if, if you perform this uh, coupling uh, between models and images on uh, patient-specific data, then uh, this leads to what I call a personalized model. So personalized model is a model which is specific to a given patient. And this is uh, very interesting for uh, planning, guidance, and diagnosis. But you can also apply this not only to a single patient, but to a whole population. And then you, you can be interested into uh, looking at the, the statistical analysis of the viability uh, across the population. And this is very important for diagnosis in order to discriminate one population uh, against another, or also to come up with biomarkers in order to identify the, uh, the onset of some pathology. So um, this, uh, this both uh, patient-specific is actually a complementary aspect to the statistical analysis. Now, uh, I would like to focus more on, on the um, modeling of the heart. And um, this, uh, there actually has been uh, several groups in the world uh, uh, which is working on these uh, computational models of the heart. Actually, this, this domain has been pioneered by Denis Noble and Peter Hunter from uh, Oxford University and University of Auckland, but also there are several groups in the world. Uh, so, for instance, uh, at, uh, not so far away from here, UCSD, Andrew McCulloch is working on these topics. Uh, John Hopkins, some in several groups in, uh, in Europe and, and North America. And the focus of, uh, of cardiac modeling is uh, actually to uh, describe the, the cardiac function at uh, different scales, so from the cells to the tissue, and also to describe the different physical uh, uh, components of cardiac modeling, so including kind of flow dynamics, uh, structural uh, mechanics, and um, electrophysiology, just to name a few. And uh, this, this trend to, uh, to, to come up with uh, digital models of the heart is actually part of a larger international initiative, like the Physium project, or in Europe, there is this uh, virtual physiological human uh, project, which is uh, uh, funded by the European Union, and who, who uh, tends to develop, uh, to basically fund basic research in this field, but also to develop infrastructure uh, in order to describe, uh, let's say, the, di the different um, uh, physiological uh, behavior, so with markup uh, languages, for instance, but also to develop uh, basic tools uh, which are common to uh, different uh, problems in uh, computational physiology. So the objective of this uh, personalized cardiac modeling uh, is first uh, to uh, have a, a better understanding of cardiac physiology by performing in silico uh, 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 test, if you want, uh, to test uh, different hypotheses in silico and leads to a better understanding. The second, uh, I think, uh, objective is to uh, integrate uh, the various heterogeneous patient data. So I already mentioned that for the cardiac functions, it can be uh, uh, observed in a different manner. So you can, use, you can uh, observe its anatomy, the cardiac motion, as we've seen already in the first slide, also, you can image the perfusion, the blood flow, electrophysiology, and, and so on. And you, you can uh, register uh, all this information together. This is what I call the fusion. But you also need to integrate this information. So fusion only overlaps the information. But if you need to integrate, you need something uh, additional to uh, image fusion. You need uh, basically a computer models. And I think the, 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 computer, the computerized models that I, I will be presenting is, um, I think, very interesting in this regard. In this regard. So the, the third objective of those models is also to be able to estimate invisible quantity from images. So I already mentioned these uh, images of a cardiac motion. So you, you can definitely have an estimate of uh, velocity at each point of the heart, but you can't estimate, let's say, the pressure inside the uh, cardiac cavities. Well, if you are using uh, a, a, a physical model of the heart, and if you perform the personalization, then you can actually estimate the cardiac pressure and also the contractility of the cardiac muscles, which is a very good um, uh, index of the viability of a myocardium. 
And the fourth objective of those models is to also to predict the possible effect of therapy. So uh, I will uh, have uh, I will take actually two examples and uh, showing uh, uh, one illustration on uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is the implantation of pacemakers, where we would like to improve the patient selections and also the settings of pacemakers. And I, I think there is also uh, growing interest around the radio frequency ablation. Now, actually, uh, these are the objectives, but there are also uh, important issues. So the first issue is to create personalized models. So typically, personalized models means to estimate patient-specific parameters, and it's typically an inverse problem. An inverse problem uh, where you, ha you have some, uh, as an input, observations, and the output, uh, the parameters of this uh, personalized model. And this is uh, quite difficult, as, um, as pro you probably know and very challenging. And uh, one, one issue is, for instance, the fact that not all, not all parameters can be estimated. And also uh, the fact that you need to take into account the uncertainty, uh, uncertainty in the data. So, the, for instance, the, the segmentation of a motion that you estimate from images is uh, not free from noise. And also the uncertainty also is in the model because you have some unknown parameters that you need to estimate. So uh, I think it's very important that we come up with um, uh, computerized models that also can produce, uh, estimate the uncertainty in the models. So the second issue is, is to um, uh, devise uh, the right complexity for the models. So uh, the choosing the complexity of the models really depends on the question we want to answer. And um, also it depends, I think, on the, the type of uh, data which is available for, um, for the personalization. So my, uh, my rule of thumb is that uh, you should adapt the complexity of a model should match the complexity of the observations. So if you have only very sparse data and information about the, the cardiac motion, it's not necessary to uh, use a very sophisticated uh, uh, cardiac models because uh, you won't be able to personalize all of its parameters. Now, the third issue is, of course, validation. So you need to prove that uh, your, your models, uh, that your personalized model is able to predict, is a, has a predictive power. So and this is extremely challenging. And uh, a good strategy is to start from um, doing this personalization on, uh, on, a, on a, um, data sets which are very, uh, very rich, very complete, uh, probably uh, data sets that has been acquired in vitro or ex vivo and where you can actually calibrate your model and prove uh, that it is valid. And from that, you can move to uh, a larger number of data sets uh, of patients where you have also high quality data. But this is a, still, uh, I would say, uh, an important challenge. So now I will more uh, describe um, the problem of uh, cardiac modeling. So as I said, this is a multi-physics problem. So you need to describe the anatomy uh, you need to describe electrophysiology. So electrophysiology is uh, the, the, the fact that you have uh, electrical waves which uh, actually um, go through the heart and, uh, and command the contraction and relaxation of the cardiac muscles. And uh, so this is describing the propagation of electrical wave. Now, the mechanical behavior, of course, the cardiac is a pump. The, the heart, sorry, is a pump. And so it needs to describe this contraction and relaxation. Uh, you have also the description of the perfusion and metabolism uh, and the blood flow. Now, uh, this is a, a very uh, difficult and complex phenomena. And to do this, we have, uh, we have created at Inria an, uh, an uh, action called uh, Cardiosense 3D, which is a collaborative action, which includes uh, different uh, research groups with different expertise, uh, for instance, expertise in medical imaging, in, uh, in uh, fl uh, flow mechanics, in control, and so on, but also including uh, clinical sites for uh, specific acquisition, experimental uh, acquisition, and industrial partners. And we have also received the support from the European uh, uh, Union through this uh, EU Heart project, uh, which is a four-year project, which is gathering uh, um, different uh, re research groups on cardiac modeling. And uh, it's trying to come up with um, a, a comprehensive study of the uh, impact of those models. Now, I will uh, spend the, the rest of, of my talk describing some outcome of this research. So, um, 
illustrating the different aspect of, of, uh, of the research. So I will start with the cardiac anatomy. So uh, to, to uh, produce 3D models of the heart, uh, uh, we have um, cr created uh, software in order to perform the segmentation of, um, of, of the heart. So you can see in this image, going from the raw image, doing some filtering, extracting the blood pools, and then leading to a 3D computational mesh of the heart. But actually, uh, uh, this is not sufficient. Uh, in order to really describe uh, the function of the heart, you also need to describe the fiber orientation. The fibers, because the heart is a, is a muscles, they, uh, they play a, a key role in the cardiac mechanics and the cardiac electrophysiology. So unfortunately, it's not possible to image uh, in vivo uh, the, the fiber structure for a given patient. So uh, we have used uh, imaging, uh, so diffusion, as it's called diffusion tensor MRI, uh, of canine hearts. And so we have collaborated with uh, Johns Hopkins uh, uh, University, which has produced a database of, uh, of nine canine hearts. And we have registered uh, them together in order to create a statistical atlas. So this uh, allows us to uh, estimate the average uh, uh, structure of uh, uh, cardiac fibers but also the viability around the, uh, the mean. So it's very important uh, to uh, describe the, um, uh, basically the, the microstructure of the heart. So um, you can perform, for instance, this, this slide just shows an illustration of this work where we actually perform the fiber tracking. So at, at each point of a myocardium, you know the fiber orientation and you can also uh, extrapolate this information in the whole myocardium. And we have also produced a software called Made in Ria, which can be downloaded on the web uh, in order to do so, this fiber tracking. Now, th this is, was about the anatomy. Now, I will uh, also spend a few words about the work on modeling electrophysiology. So, uh, electrophysiology, as I said, is uh, describe the propagation of electrical waves uh, through the heart, starting from the sinus node, uh, which is like the natural pacemaker of the heart, through the atria, and then to the uh, right and left ventricles, through the so-called Purkinje fibers. And so this complex uh, propagation is, is very important, and uh, many um, cardiovascular diseases uh, have as an origin a pro uh, problem of uh, conductions in the heart. So. Uh, if you want to model the cardiac electrophysiology, you need to uh, describe the exchange of ions uh, at the level of the cardiac cells. So uh, at the cardiac cells, you have exchange of uh, different ions. So this movie here just shows the exchange of uh, potassium, uh, calcium, and sodium ions through the membrane of the cardiac cells. And this exchange of ions creates a change of potentials. And if you want to describe this uh, in a numerical way, mathematically, uh, you need to um, propose uh, different uh, models with various complexity. And here we have used uh, um, a low complexity models, phenomenological models, which is basically uh, represented as a reaction diffusion equations with two variables, where we also take into account the anisotropy of the diffusion, since the electrical signals uh, travel twice as fast along the fiber orientation than in the other directions. So um, doing uh, numerical analysis, you can um, uh, simulate electrophysiology propagation. Uh, so this is an example here. And the color corresponds to the action potential, to the difference of potential across the, the uh, cardiac cells. And you can see that here, the, the, the signal starts at the apex of the left ventricles here due to a stimulation and then propagates through the heart. You can have a look here at the isochrones. Now, from electrophysiology, you can also uh, move to the uh, mechanics. So uh, to do this, you need to, to model the coupling between electrophysiology and mechanics. So as I said, the electro electrophysiology signals act as a, uh, a command. So commands the contraction and relaxation. So you need to model this relationship between potential and contraction. And uh, the model that we are using has been inspired from the a description of a, uh, of a sarcomere where you have a binding and unbinding of actinosine uh, fi uh, filaments. 
and which can be described in a macroscopic way through the different uh, set of equations. Uh, this is just to uh, show that uh, the approach we have taken is, uh, uh, is basically a multi-scale approach. So we, we, uh, we start from uh, uh, statistical mechanics at the level uh, of a sarcomere, and then we can, uh, by doing anal mathematical analysis, move to uh, microscopic models at the level of a uh, heart. And, and uh, if you do this, you can uh, produce um, simulation of a, produce a beating heart model, as you can see here. Uh, and, and this movie shows the uh, relationship between electrophysiology, so the color here corresponds to uh, the propagation of these electric waves. And you, you can see a correlation between these uh, waves. If you slow down, for instance, the motion, you can see that the contraction, uh, the, the depolarization of, uh, of a myocardium corresponds to a contraction of the heart. So actually, this is a bit more complex than that because you need to take into account the four cardiac phases. So the feeling, isovolumetric contraction, ejection, and isovolumetric relaxation in order to, to model the whole cardiac cycle. Uh, and uh, this is done uh, also through um, different boundary conditions and you need to model the, uh, the cardiac mechanics as a hyperelastic materials and so on. So this actually requires some sophisticated computation and uh, the simulation that I show here typically takes uh, 20 to 30 minutes of computation for one cardiac cycle on a PC computer. And uh, with this simulation, you can actually uh, extract some meaningful uh, parameters, such as the volume and pressure, uh, pressure curves, and you can compute this locally and globally. And then you can start to personalize the model. So right now I've described a generic model of heart. Now we have to move to a patient-specific one. So uh, again, the concept of personalization is uh, on the uh, right-hand side, a 3D uh, electric mechanical model of the heart. On the left-hand side, patient-specific uh, uh, images of a patient and electrophysiology. And then producing a personalized models of the geometry, electrophysiology, cinematics, and mechanics. So I will start by uh, illustrating some results uh, of this uh, uh, on electrophysiology. And, and just uh, to illustrate this, uh, just showing some uh, joint work uh, with um, uh, the group uh, of Sony Brooks Health Science Center in Toronto, where they are performing ex vivo optical imaging. So what you see on the left-hand side is an ex vivo porcine heart which is perfused and which is uh, stimulated. And using optical imaging, you can, uh, that's what you see on the right-hand side, you can image the uh, pro propagation of an electrical wave through the heart, okay? So this change of color corresponds to the change of transmembrane potential. And this is exactly what we are modeling in the uh, models I've shown before. And therefore, um, you, you can perform a personalization. So, here, I've taken again the, I've processed the images just to see the, uh, the, the um, let's say, uh, the waves that go through the heart. So without personalization, you see that there is not really a real agreement between the simulation and the observations. But after personalization, so you estimate some parameters, you optimize, you, do, you perform some inverse, uh, you inverse uh, problems. Then you can uh, uh, basically estimate some connection velocity such that uh, what you simulate on the right is similar to what you observe on the middle, okay? But uh, one can ask, okay, you have personalized, you can estimate parameters, but does it have a predictive value? And to check this, we have uh, uh, stimulated at a, known, at a known location the, um, uh, the, the myocardium, and then we have simulated the same simulation in silico, and then we have compared the simulation, the predicted propagation, with the actual ones. So you can see here that actually the simulation here matched fairly well the uh, uh, observations. And this is not, uh, this has not been learned. This is really the uh, predictive power of a model. And you can uh, do the same thing with a different uh, pacing location. Okay, when you hear you pace from the right ventricle, as opposed to the left ventricle. And you can see also that the, the simulated patterns match the uh, observed ones. 
Okay, so this is for electrophysiology. Now you can also personalize your models for the mechanics. So in this movie, uh, you see, for instance, in, in white, in white, this is the, the cardiac, uh, the heart, sorry, that has been delineated during the cardiac cycle. So, okay, so it, it, it matches uh, basically the myocardium during the um, cardiac cycle. And in blue, curves correspond to a, a generic uh, model of the heart. So you can see that the, basically the blue curves, the blue, the blue heart doesn't beat uh, as in the image because it has not been personalized. Now, uh, after doing some personalizations, which is here has been done through uh, using an adjoint method, uh, you can estimate some contractility parameters uh, such that now the, the personalized models shown here in, in green actually follows quite well uh, their uh, observations, okay? And uh, once we have personalized this model, uh, as seen here, both from electrophysiology and mechanics, we can start to uh, uh, use it for uh, therapy planning. So this is the, the last part of my presentation, is uh, how to use personalized models for therapy planning. And I will uh, use a, a, sim a single example, which is the virtual cardiac recirculation therapy. So which is uh, the uh, implantation of pacemakers in order to stimulate the heart. Okay, so you, you have to know that there is actually uh, an issue here since up to one third, let's say, of patients with pacemakers implanted, uh, they show no be clinical benefits. And uh, this means that there, there's a need to improve the selection of patients for CRT as well as the setting of, of, of pacemakers. So it may be that, the, 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 let's say, the, the different, there are different ways of stimulating the heart through so two, uh, let's say, two, two pacing leads, three pacing leads, and different locations, and also different settings, uh, delays between those, pace, those pacemakers. So uh, maybe we can, uh, we can have a better outcome if we can simulate in silico those pacemakers. So for, to uh, tackle this, we have uh, pursued uh, the, what we call a proof of concept on a single patient. Well, we first personalized these models uh, uh, in terms of electro, uh, electro uh, mechanics. And I show here in these curves, okay, these curves uh, show the, um, the pressure curves. So the red curve is the measured one, and the dotted line calls, shows the simulated ones. So we uh, basically estimate some mechanical parameters such that the heart beats just like in the images. And you can see that there is a good agreement between the two pressure curves. So actually in cardiac uh, physiology, you are not only interested in pressure, but the rise of pressure, which is what I call the pressure rate or DPDT, which is a good index of contractility. And you can see also there's a good agreement between the pressure rates, uh, which is simulated and measured ones. Now, uh, what we're doing is that we're simulating in silico the implantation of pacemakers so different, uh, pace, uh, different location of those uh, pacemakers. It can be biventricular pacing, triventricular pacing with different delays. And then uh, we can, if we do this, we can predict the change of pressure depending on the location of, uh, of leads. And we can compare the prediction of pressure with the actual measure. So actually, the, in this case, the, the, the pressure was measured through a catheter which was introduced in the left ventricles, so that we have a, a true pressure, which is uh, not a common procedure, but in this case, this allowed us to have a, a validation of our models. So you can see that, um, so we, we learned the mechanical parameters such that we have a good agreement without pacemakers, but we were actually surprised to see that we had a, a good agreement also uh, when we have a different, uh, with a pacemaker. So in this case, we were able to predict the DPDT uh, due to uh, some configuration of a pacemaker leads. So this is encouraging to show a potential of using uh, patient-specific models of the heart in order to improve the planning here of, of, um, of CRT. Okay, now I will uh, actually conclude uh, my presentation. I will uh, just uh, mention some, I think, challenges. Um, so... I think there is still need to improve the modeling in many different aspects. For instance, uh, imp uh, what I've showed, uh, we don't take into account specifically the blood flow. It is taken into, in terms of, body of uh, boundary conditions, but there is no uh, uh, simulation of, of flow. So there is a need to actually do what we call fluid structure interaction 
and to, to couple the modeling of flow in, in the cavities with the mechanics and electrophysiology. There's also a need to simulate perfusion, uh, remodeling. Uh, there's also a need to have a better automated uh, personalization. So a lot of this personalization is still uh, uh, okay, uh, done uh, in an experimental manner and so needs to be um, more automated. And um, we are also interested in Atenria to uh, have a, re a real-time simulation for training of endovascular procedure and especially re radio frequency ablation. So, uh, as you know, these procedures that are performed endovascularly are, are fairly difficult, especially to navi the navigation is difficult and the management of the different signal is difficult. So there is a need to, to prof provide um, a system where the cardiologists could actually train. And so this is something that we are working on. And also we are developing more proof of concept for CRT and ablation of cardiac arrhythmias. And uh, of course, uh, we need to perform uh, further validations uh, on some uh, fairly uh, sophisticated data sets first, and then we will move to more, uh, I would say, uh, common uh, imaging uh, information of patients. Just, just to summarize what I've, what I've uh, mentioned in my presentation, so I, I, I wanted to show that uh, the models that we use for analyzing images are not just based on geometry, but they also uh, based on, on statistics and um, image appearance, biomechanics, and physiology. And there is a growing need, actually, to develop those uh, more sophisticated models which are uh, uh, related to biomechanics and physiology. And each uh, of those uh, mod uh, uh, level of models can be personalized. And the current trend is uh, actually to uh, move from uh, geometric to physical and physiological models. Also to go from generic to patient-specific models. Also, uh, and I didn't really mention a lot about that, but also to move from deterministic models to probabilistic in order to include some confidence intervals. And uh, also uh, to, to demonstrate the uh, importance of those models first on, on CRP planning, just as I've shown for CRT, and then to move from CRP planning to CRP training for, uh, let's say, gesture training, and also diagnosis and, and CRP guidance. So to finish, I'd like to acknowledge my, um, my colleagues at INRIA and, uh, and collaborators, and we'd like to thank you for your attention during this presentation. We have time for some questions for Professor Delingat. Right. Simulating a heart. Right. And I was just wondering about heart the real heart you were simulating now, was that an animal? No, 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 it was a, a patient. How do you so how do you do that ethically? Or when a human heart is simulating like that? Okay, okay, now uh, I see what you mean. So this was done retrospectively. So this patient had a, a, C, a CRT intervention. So he had a implantation of of, of uh, pacemakers. Okay. And so they, um, they, they've made a, a, a classical approach of trying the different settings of those pacemakers. And then they introduced also, they measured in a, uh, electrophysiology in this heart and also measured the, the cardiac uh, mechanics. So there's nothing ethically challenging here. The only thing that was really specific is that they were able to measure electrophysiology in a great uh, accuracy with a sophisticated method, which is not classically used. But this was done retrospectively. Okay. Okay. Exactly. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. Imagine if you took a heart out of a body, would it still? Beat? If you took a heart right. out of a body, would it still beat or do you need the body? Okay, all to right. So, 
Yeah, I see. Well, I, uh, I showed the slice uh, slide with uh, ex vivo heart, porcine yeah. heart. Yes, it can uh, within a few hours of its uh, extraction. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. So, of course, there are specific experimental uh, settings. It's perfused and uh, specific conditions. But, yes, uh, you can uh, use ex vivo beating hearts uh, for a few hours when you can do experiments. Yeah. Well, thank you. Other questions? Oh, yes, there you go. Uh, so you said that uh, it takes about 20 to 40 minutes on a normal PC computer to do the simulation, right? Of oh, one cardiac cycle, yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering uh, what methods do you use or how long does it take uh, to uh, you know, characterize a human art and then put in the appropriate, extract out the appropriate set of yeah. parameters? Okay, yes, uh, a lot of work are actually, um, okay, the, 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 the challenge is not, not so much the, the cardiac anatomy extraction. So this is straightforward. There are, I think nowadays uh, there are even automated uh, yeah, procedures for that. So the, the difficulty is to do the electrophysiology uh, analysis and the personalization. And, uh, and above all, it is the... Um, uh, I would say the uh, the mechanics. Uh, the mechanics is is complex because of the boundary conditions. So, for instance, the heart is attached at the at the level of um, of the valves, and um, it's it's not obvious to really have a, from the first start a real beating heart that looks reasonable. Uh, so, you really need to to devise some specific boundary conditions. Also, the the thickness uh, of, of our um, uh, of a myocardium plays a key role. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the right ventricle is uh, like twice as thin as the left ventricle. And so sometimes, uh, with the first set of parameters, you end up with some uh, not uh, realistic uh, beating heart motion. So uh, all this is, uh, is not automated at all, and right now it's still experimental. So from the first acquisition to, uh, um, let's say, the, 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 the simulation, it takes probably, let's say, one week of analysis by a Goyard student. Uh, maybe less if he's at the end of his thesis, but uh, otherwise it's, it's still a lot of work. And uh, the computational part uh, uh, is not necessarily the most difficult one. Yeah. And uh, the tw 20 to 30 minutes corresponds to a simulation. So this used finite elements, uh, linear tetrahedra. Um, uh, there's nothing uh, real fancy about that, but uh, we are right now inquiring using a GPU to, uh, to go faster. Uh, for, but, uh, so maybe we, we think that uh, within uh, 10 minutes, we should be able to have a, a one cardiac cycle simulation or even five minutes maybe. But again, the complexity of a model depends on what you are want to answer. So uh, for instance, some colleagues at uh, Karlsruhe, they are simulating uh, uh, one cardiac cycle uh, using the blue gene uh, computer at IBM. So it takes probably, uh, you know, several days for just one cardiac cycle because it, they are looking at different phenomena within the heart. And so uh, in our case, we are looking at more microscopic uh, behavior of the heart. So we probably don't need such a detailed models. Other questions? Yes. How, how do you envision then measuring the EP uh, parameters in vivo? I mean, like, um, these procedures are very inaccurate if you uh, use a catheter to, to measure them. Yeah. Uh, you'll have a lot of, um, you know, um, I guess, uh, uh, corrupted measurements in order yeah. to do this. So how will that affect your okay, models? Yeah. So um, actually, in all what I've shown, we, we are using um, non-contact mapping, so as opposed to contact uh, catheters. So non-contact mapping, they, it's a device uh, with like a balloon inside the heart, uh, which is able to measure the whole electrophysiology together in the cavity. So a agree view of the reconstructed surface is not accurate, but the fact is we are combining uh, the geometry from MR with the electrophysiology measurements, and then we are registering the two information. So... Um, Despite the fact that uh, there are some source of uncertainty, I think the systems, the catheter systems, are being um, improved. And nowadays, you, you, I think you have a, 
uh, not for all patients, but you have a, a very good agreement nowadays of a geometry acquired by in electrophysiology and the one acquired in MR. And definitely this fusion of electrophysiology and MR or CT is uh, um, very important and, and uh, many, um, a lot of research is, is done uh, in this case. So I should mention that um, here we are using a, a, a specific uh, setup which is called the XMR uh, suit. So this is an, in um, King's College London. Well, they have an XMR suit. So it's, uh, in the same room you have an MR machine, MR donuts, and the patient is being translated and then go to the cath lab, catheter lab, where you have all the electrophysiology. And this allows to perform a very easy fusion of electrophysiology and, uh, um, and anatomy. And actually, this fusion is performed uh, during, the, during the, the, the procedure. So you get direct guidance. And so um, this also is a bit specific, and that's how we managed to get the first result, I think, using this specific setup. So, so you envision measuring the parameters and then coming up with the model very quickly and being... We, yeah. during, while doing the yeah. procedures being no, able to... Uh, right now, no, no, no. So uh, the guidance is used only for the fusion. It's a geometric registration, okay? But not the modeling and the personalization is not done during the, the procedure. Uh, actually, what we would like to do is, uh, is indeed uh, being able to uh, test different hypotheses of electrophysiology uh, during the air fabrication, for instance. If you were to test, if you have, uh, what if I ablate at this level? What would be the patterns? And does it agree with what I observe? Uh, but right now, we are not at this stage. But definitely, this is like a, a midterm goal for us. Thank you. Other questions? Hervé, thank you very, very much. Thank you.